a practice management series tonight. Tonight, our session is being moderated and led by Dr. Julie Bishop, who's an expert in the field. And she'll be talking about billing coding, shoulder, billing and coding for shoulder and elbow surgery. Uh, Dr. Samar Hassan and, and myself are chair, co-chairs of the education committee. And we'll be managing the chat room. So please feel free to ask as many questions as you like. And we'll pepper the, the, uh, uh, Dr. Bishop and the, audio, and the panelists with, with, uh, with the questions throughout. So with that, Dr. Bishop. All right, well, can you all see my screen okay? Yes. Perfect. Well, welcome everyone and thanks for coming to tonight. Um, this is uh, the billing and coding for shoulder and elbow um, lecture. And this is part of a virtual fellows didactic spirit, uh, series that uh, Dr. Levine has spearheaded. And it's really the winter bridge between the didactic sessions that'll resume back in spring. It is aimed at our shoulder and elbow fellows, but our senior and chief residents as well, who are really actively looking at getting their first uh, real job as orthopedic surgeons. This is the uh, third session in the eight week series. And tonight for our panel, we have myself as a moderator, I'm a shoulder surgeon at Ohio State, and I'm the ASES representative to the coding um, committee for um, the AAOS. And I'm also um, the AAOS alter alternate for the uh, CPT editorial panel. We have Rob Gillespie from uh, Case Western, a shoulder surgeon, Kave Sajada from Lexington, Kentucky, a shoulder and elbow surgeon. And then we also have Betsy Nolan, a shoulder and elbow surgeon, and also uh, brings a great wealth as the president and CEO of her own shoulder um, practice. Our agenda tonight is uh, first just over, you know, go through the overview of the coding process and I'll go through that. Then Dr. Gillespie will go through the basics of shoulder coding, bundling, modifiers, what ICD-10 is. And then Dr. Sajada will go through ENM coding, which are big changes for 2021. Betsy Nolan will go through the practice management, um, coding and billing. And then hopefully we have some time for questions. And the goal is to make this interactive, certainly um, send messages through the chat at the end of each talk, but real specific ones we can really, um, or broad ones we can um, go through at the end. And the chat function will monitor throughout the sessions. And so I'll start, uh, you know, we all saw when we were little those shows about how a bill becomes a law. So I think what a lot of people don't know, even practicing orthopedic surgeons, is how does a surgical procedure become payment in your pocket? So first we'll start with CPT. That is current procedural terminology code, CPT codes. And we use these for medical billing to represent unique medical procedures. For instance, 29827 is arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. So what the code involves is that um, description of the procedure and that code set 29827. And this is a key component in most of all the physician payment arrangements that we have. The CPT editorial panel is responsible for maintaining the CPT code set for all specialties, so every medical specialty. And the goal of the panel is to revise, update, and modify codes. There are 17 members on the panel, and there's 11 physicians from medical specialties. We are lucky to have a representative from orthopedics right now on the panel, but we don't always have that. And then there's the CPT advisory committee, and this supports the CPT editorial panel. And there are representatives of all the national medical societies. For orthopedics, AAOS has a CPT advisor and the alternate advisor, which is myself. And then the hand society, foot and ankle society, and the AOA each have a representative. The role of the committee is to be a resource for advice to the CPT editorial panel on all aspects of coding to answer coding questions that uh, members send um, to the AMA. They go through the CPT editorial panel and are funneled down. Um, they provide documentation regarding appropriateness of various medical uh, surgical procedures that are under consideration for inclusion in CPT. And they also are tasked with educating their members on the proper use and proper uh, benefits of CPT. There are three CPT meetings per year. Right now they're all virtual. All societies participate. And at these meetings, um, the codes are reviewed. All new codes or coding changes are reviewed. They review how to code new and emerging technologies. 
And then they address outmoded, um, or outmoded services and procedures and um, what is no longer utilized. So how do these new codes come into existence? So first, one submits a coding change application. And this can be submitted by anyone, even industry can submit this, but it must be sponsored by physicians. And this is several months in advance. There are three levels of category uh, codes. And what we all want is a category one CPT code. This is what we use. This is what we get paid for. The category two codes are really tracking codes for performance, uh, measurement, and quality. And then the category three codes are really for emerging technology that aren't quite ready for the number, uh, the category one code. But we track the technology over a five year time frame to see if this is something worthy of being a category one code. And all category one codes, because everyone wants to know why isn't there a code for this? You know, why don't we have a code for this procedure? And it's a very detailed, difficult process. It must be FDA approved. It must be a distinct service performed by many orthopedic surgeons. So it can't just be a small niche performed by five people in the country. The clinical efficacy has to be well established and documented in the, new, the US literature. So they really want level one and level two studies. Um, you need much more than level four retrospective studies. And the procedure has to be um, a new procedure, not a fragmentation of a current procedure or something that can currently be reported by another code. This code change application is brought before the panel and then all societies can comment the panel members ask questions of the presenters, they direct questions towards them, and ultimately the CPT editorial panel votes on whether this can become a true CPT code. So let's say it's approved. The next step then is to go to the RUC. That's the RVS Update Committee, otherwise known as the RUC, which is a resource-based relative value scale update committee. There are 31 physicians and 300 medical advisors for the RUC. And the main advisory body to CMS is the RUC, and they advise them on the value of new and revised CPT codes. The main focus of the RUC is physician work, determining the value of physician work. But there's also the Practice Expense Review Committee, and they develop recommendations on practice expense RVUs for CPT codes. For instance, what is the overhead that your office needs to support the rotator cuff CPT code? And what is an RVU? That's a relative value unit. Um, the majority is physician work, 52%. The practice expense is 44%. And then malpractice is 4%. And the CPT panel submits these codes to the RUC. And then the RUC um, has survey instruments that are sent to the specialty societies to evaluate work. So let's say they are going to survey the total hip or the total shoulder code. A survey is sent um, to physicians in the orthopedic societies. They take the survey and time is the biggest determinant of physician work. So they're determining how much time you spend pre, intra and post, that post-op global period. And that helps determine um, the recommendations for the RVS committee to make for the final um, RVU number. They make those recommendations to the RUC and there are three RUC meetings per year. And the RUC can accept, refer back, or modify those recommendations. And then the final recommendation is submitted to CMS. And then CMS, uh, which is Center for Medicare Services, will publish those decisions in a Medicare physician fee schedule. And then how does that turn into a dollar? So remember, RVU is work, practice expense, and malpractice. That's then multiplied by a geographic practice cost indice. So where you are in the country determines um, some of the value. And then that is uh, multiplied by the conversion factor, which is a dollar figure that translates the total RVU for each CPT code into the final fee. This is a very complex formula that's updated on a yearly basis. And the goal is to maintain budget neutrality. And what budget neutrality means that if one society or one, one service gets more RVUs, it has to come out of another. So it must be maintained uh, neutral. And then the physician fee schedule determines the insurance payments for physician billing. Many commercial insurances will follow this Medicare payment formula as the basis for their payment, but they might have a multiplier. So we're going to pay 110% of Medicare, for instance. 
And I think the bottom line for this is a lot of people don't know so much goes on behind the scenes. We must be engaged to protect our reimbursement. There aren't people at the table who are worried that the orthopedic surgeons aren't making enough money. So we are all engaged and your societies are all having representation at every level so we can do the best for our members. So with that, we will go into the basics of shoulder and elbow coding with Dr. Gillespie. All right. Thanks, Julie. We always have a couple uh, this time of year are usually in the Ohio Shoulder and Elbow Society. So we're looking forward to getting back to live meetings. I'd like to thank everyone for putting this together, uh, especially Rajan, uh, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Hassan uh, for the education uh, committee. So basics of coding. Uh, my full disclosure is, is that probably be better talking to all of you guys about this complex revision in front of us right here. Uh, but I think it's very important uh, what we're talking about today in terms of the coding and everything else. Uh, and so, uh, Julie, could you go to the next slide? You know, every year <clears throat> there's new rules, uh, and I think that's an important overriding theme we're going to see here. This is a constantly changing thing. What I talk to my uh, junior partners about all the time is, is to meet with the coders and meet with uh, whoever's in your practice who are the experts at this and also stay up to date on the Academy and the ASES websites uh, on a more, almost annual basis for this, uh, just because it's a very complex thing coding, as you can see just from Dr. Bishop's talk about everything else that uh, is on there. So uh, go to the next slide. So my outline, uh, what uh, Dr. Bishop asked me to talk about tonight was one, talk about ICD-10 codes, what they are and what, what it means, what's the CCI, Talk briefly about modifiers in general, um, bundling in general, and then some shoulder specific coding issues. And most of this is gonna be related to uh, you know, shoulder uh, uh, cases in the outpatient or inpatient setting. So what's the ICD-10? Well, it's International Classification Diseases, the 10th revision. Uh, I'm in, uh, finished my 10th year in practice and ICD-9 was in my first four or five years. So the CMS again comes through and revises how diagnosis codes are. I think this is critical for everyone to understand. There's 69,000 codes. They range from three to seven characters. They usually have a, they all start with an alpha and then that always goes to an, a number. And then the, after that can be a mix of alpha and numeric. I think this is a critical thing because the better you state your diagnosis, the better your coders and other people at the hospital and in your practice will be able to get reimbursed for what you are doing. So I think that's critical. If you go to the next slide. So there's a lot of common shoulder codes. Uh, this is, you know, just sort of uh, alphabet soup of shoulder codes for sprains. Uh, Dr. Bishop, go to the next slide, please. And there's more here, right? So some, some of these are some of my more common codes. Um, if any of you who are on this call would like to have this list, it's I'm happy for you to have my PowerPoint. Um, it's not all inclusive, but it's a nice list to start with, especially when you're going into practice. As you can see here, there's a lot of different codes. They all uh, in general, for a lot of what we do, start with M, uh, and, and it also designates the side, right? So all right shoulders or right elbows are end with a one, left shoulders end with a two. So go to the next slide, please. Um, and again, more and more codes. Again, I think this is critical that these things uh, you know about, and the better you categorize your diagnosis, uh, the better your coders and you are going to be reimbursed uh, long-term for this. Uh, go to the next slide. So CCI, a lot of a lot of names here, and you know I don't expect you all to remember this or even uh, be able to pull this out, but I think it's important to have an understanding that there's a lot of committees, as Dr. Bishop alluded to. There's a lot of people who are actively involved in protecting what we're doing and making sure we get paid accordingly for what we do. So this is correct coding initiatives. It promotes national correct coding methodologies and and. And they're attempting to reduce improper coding, which you know you can call inappropriate payments or, uh, in a worst case scenario, fraud. Um, so they're looking at that and making sure that the coding is as, as easy as it can be. Uh, this can happen annually, and it does tend to. And this year, there's been a lot of changes that uh, some of my colleagues are going to talk more about in terms of the outpatient setting in a little bit. Go to the next slide. I will tell you as we're waiting for technical difficulties. That's all right. I can talk without my slides. I mean, I would tell you that as we're waiting for the next slide, 
Um, I'm talking to you from an academic orthopedic surgeon okay. standpoint. There's a lot of different points of view and I'm excited to hear what other have to say on the panel because I do think we have a different point of view of how this works. Um, so the, the next few slides are gonna be talking about uh, things that I think are critical and Dr. Bishop thought were critical to understanding in this talk. And the first is modifiers. So what are modifiers? Well, CPT modifiers, meaning uh, procedural modifiers are used to supplement the information from just the CPT code to provide some extra details concerning what we're doing as a physician and in our case as surgeons in the outpatient setting or the inpatient setting. Uh, they don't change the definition of our code. They just help uh, the coders and the uh, insurance companies of Medicare understand what we did. Next slide. So this is actually from my uh, terrible EMR. Um, we do not have Epic where I work. That's coming in the next five years, but this is what we have. And as you can see here on every, every procedure I do, I have the option of a lot of um, modifiers. And we're gonna go through, I think six or seven of the most common modifiers. And if anyone has any more questions about some of these modifiers, I think this is critical to understanding uh, what you're doing. So go to the next slide. So the 22 modifiers, probably one of the most common modifiers used in orthopedics. It's basically saying that you're working harder. Um, it's, it's increased procedural service substantially greater than what is expected within that CPT code. So if you code for a total shoulder replacement, and there's something significantly harder about it, meaning it's not a revision because there's a different code for that, but it, it was you know maybe a morbidly obese patient or they had a complex glenoid that you had to do bone grafting for, then this is where that 22 modifier would come in. Uh, the key about the 22 modifiers is that you have to dictate that you did something with it. You can't just say, hey, that I, I'm going to 22 modify it because then that will just lead to lots and lots of questions from coders and insurance companies. So always make sure that you dictate and document what you do. Next slide. Hey, Rob, be yeah. before you go on, it's Bill. Um, yeah. Can I just ask a quick question? Absolutely. Do you, do you get an audit from your coders, for example, uh, hey, Dr. Gillespie, you used the 22 modifier 25 times last year and you got paid one out of 25. Do you get, do you, do you get uh, updates? And if so, how does that influence your decision making on how to code? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So Dr. Levine is basically asking what our, our coders tell us about what we're doing. And, and so I could think that I'm billing all these modifiers and I'm billing all these bundled procedure, uh, unbundled procedures, but I might not be getting paid for it. So I do get that. I haven't gotten that for 2020 yet. I do get that, so I'm aware of that. So our hospital does provide that information to us and lets us know whatever we build or what we got. And it has changed in, in, uh, in, a, in a way more with my 59 use of 59 modifiers or even here the 51 modifier than the 22. We tend to do, we get about, recently I've gotten about half of my 22 modifiers, but I use it pretty rarely. Um, and I, I only use it for extreme circumstances. So it may be that I don't use it enough, but it's a great question. So um, the 51 modifier is, is going along the same, similar kind of lines in that when we're talking about procedures, there's standalone codes and there's add-on codes, meaning that there's codes that do, do not need motor modifiers. So this is somewhat, you know, this takes a while to wrap your head around a little bit. Um, meaning that if you're doing something that is not standalone, I mean a rotator cuff repair and you're doing other things like an arthroscopic biceps tenodesis, which is 29828, and a lot of us do that at the same time as doing a rotator cuff repair, well, those can be modified so that they know that they were, separate, they were procedures that we're doing at the same time as that rotator cuff repair. So you would build your first one, which is the highest RVU production first, which is usually the rotator cuff repair, and then you add a modifier to the other two. Uh, I think, Julia, uh, before you yeah. continue, uh, uh, important question from the from the from the group. Yeah. Uh, what do you document in the operative note to get paid for the 22 modifier? Yeah, that's is, a great question. And I is mean, there a certain amount of more time you must spend to qualify for this code? You know, I don't know if there's a certain amount more time. Maybe someone on the panel knows that. I do. I do always, whenever I use a 22 modifier, I specify what it is I did and how long it took me to do it. And usually I try at least 30 to 45 minutes for, for those things. And uh, Dr. Nolan just put it in twice the usual time for that code. I, I would also tell you too, that it's, it's really good to express it in a percentage because that's what you're really looking for is an upcharge on your base work. So 
say I spent 30 minutes or 40 minutes or, you know, or double. And, and I can tell you, Betsy, we'll, we'll get some for less than that, but it has to be substantial. So 50% extra and specify exactly what it was. Was the BMI 45? Was, the, was it a, a type C glenoid with severe retroversion? Did it need more assistance or more retraction or longer time to expose or close? The more specific, the better. Over. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, again, I think that there's some of it, you'll find that the more you, the more you document, the easier it is for the coders to get reimbursed for what you do. Uh, go to the next slide. So the 59 modifier is a, is a little bit different than the 51, meaning this is a distinct procedural service. I think this is slightly confusing. And in my personal opinion, it's one that's a little bit overused sometimes in orthopedics. And I haven't found that it actually gets reimbursed as much as I was hoping um, when I first started in practice 10 years ago. But basically you have, you're doing a procedure that are not normally reported together, meaning they're not in the same body part, meaning they're not in the shoulder or close to the shoulder or a separate incision. Um, and that's not ordinarily encountered or performed on the same diet by the same physician. So an easy one on that would be like if you did a cubital tunnel release at the same time as doing a rotator cuff repair. Those are two separate procedures. Um, I think a lot of us, and I, I would welcome what the panel does on this, but a lot of people use the 59 modifier for an open bicep senodesis after a rotator cuff repair because it's a separate incision and in theory, a separate procedure. Um, I've gone away from using the 59 not modifier on that because I wasn't finding I was getting reimbursed for it in that way, but I would open it up to the panel to see if that's something they do because I think that's a very common thing in the shoulder and elbow world. Anybody? I would tell you, and there is some regional variance in this as far as the administrators. So Julie talked about CMS uh, billing, but there are also regional administrators for each of these services. And sometimes they, uh, in, in our experience, we've had more trouble with the 51 than the 59 modifier utilization. So I probably use the 51 pretty rarely, but use the 59 much as you would use the 51 simply because of our payers specifying that that's how we need to use it. Same with us in New York. Yeah, I rarely use the 51 modifier. Now, I would say most people, the most important thing is to know what your negotiations are with your insurance companies, even for modifier 22, because you need to negotiate with the insurance providers to make sure that they will recognize modifier 22. So I think everything is really unique to where you are and you want to be engaged in what's going on, you know, in your location. So I'll try to move along here. I don't want to take too much time. I think there's some really important stuff coming afterwards, but I grouped these modifiers 80, 81, and 82 together because I do think they're important. And actually we uh, talk with our coders at our hospital a fair amount about this. This is when another surgeon is assisting. And the way that uh, we use it is, I, I actually use the modifier 80 a fair amount. I always have residents with me, um, but even if I don't have residents with me, I, I use the modifier 80 if we do a procedure together. Uh, meaning if one of my partners and I do this procedure together. 81 would be more something you use if you're doing something, you get into trouble and let's say another orthopedic surgeon has to come in and help you do something and it's a very small amount of time, then they would use the modifier 81. In general, the modifier 82, and this is something I might uh, defer to someone else about because our coders have told us to use modifier 80 even in the setting of no resident available. Um, where there is no qualified resident available, much like you would use an assist for your nurse practitioner or your APP. The next slide. All right, so bundling. The basic way you just think about bundling is you can't bill for both, right? So there's certain codes that you have that you can, you are, that are including other bills, meaning that even if you think that they're separate procedures, they're all included in that one sort of global bundle fee. Um, and it's important for you to know which of these surgical codes can be reimbursed either separately or in combination. In general, CMS recognizes three areas of the shoulder and they're a good way to thinking about it. One, the glenohumeral joint, two, the subcromial space, and three, the acromioclavicular joint. And if you're doing something in those separate regions, in general, you can unbundle those, meaning you can bill for those uh, CPT codes separately. Um, 
But on this flip side, I've seen lots of places that consider the shoulder to be a single anatomic structure, meaning that most things like a 29827 will uh, bundle with certain codes. Um, so again, an important thing to understand in your region, your hospital, what uh, can be bundled or what can't be. Uh, this is an important slide because I think it's something that uh, is uh, critical that has changed over the last couple of years. Um, so this is limited and extensive debridement. Uh, 29822 is a limited debridement and really can only be built alone, meaning not with something else. Um, 29823 is included in most other shoulder arthroscopy procedures with the exception of the rotator cuff repair of the arthroscopic biceps tenodesis or the distal clavicle. So I think these two codes are interesting. I think there's been something in the chat about this that I saw blink up a couple of times. I don't know if anyone wants to elaborate on what was on the chat on this. The, the question for the panel was, when do, you, when do you actually use 29823 when arthroscopic work? Like what, what actually has to be done to justify this code? And yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll answer that because the uh, CPT actually had us rewrite the vignettes this past year and they are now um, new in 2021. And so now it's very clear um, for 29823 that you must debris three separate stru structures that are not part of what your primary cold is. For instance, if you're doing your cuff repair, one of the structures that you use to get 29823 cannot be your debridement of the rotator cuff. So there's a whole list in CPT um, that you can look at that says, um, what you can debris, and it's you know the labrum, the cartilage, the bone on the glenoid, the cartilage, the bone on the humeral head, um, the rotator cuff, um, the superior labrum, the biceps. So there's a whole list, but you have to get three separate structures that are not part of one of your primary codes. And Julie, interesting... can, Julie, can you just yep. make sure? So what about bursa? Is bursa one of the three? So it is not one of the three if you do a subacromial decompression. If you don't do a subacromial decompression, because that is inherent to a subacromial decompression, but if you don't do 28826, then you can use the bursa. So just so everybody understands, this is an extremely controversial topic and Dr. Bishop was instrumental in representing ASCS on this topic. Uh, but what happened for, we won't get into too much details, but 29826, which was arthroscopic acromioplasty, got eviscerated because of a lot of, uh, of uh, evidence-based medicine that, that questioned the validity of acromioplasties. And so we were our own worst enemies. And so they then took away the work RVUs from 29826, which led to a rapid epidemic of 29823 substituting for 29826. And guess who got wind of that? Uh, the Ruck people. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because it, it, there's still some insurance companies that will accept 29826, but we've had a lot of recent run of denials over the last six months on that. So it's almost, I almost don't even bill for it anymore, or even put it in for the pre-certification. Another question for the group is when you build when you bill unbundled in different areas, does that mean you use modifier 59 or modify 51? I'll defer to the rest of the panel, but I think that's what we were alluding to that is worth repeating. It sort of depends on where you are and how your coders want you to do it. Correct, I, I agree. For us, it's, it's 51, um, but it might be different other places. All right, um, so this is then going another kind of sort of bundling theory and I guess this is considering whether or not uh, where you are, and again, you're in the glenohumeral joint for a slap lesion. And so debridement of the labrum and the biceps tendon at the same time as a repair of that slap lesion cannot be put together. So it's considered included in the primary procedure when performed on the same shoulder, same part of the glenohumeral, or same part of the shoulder meaning the glenohumeral joint. Next slide. Um, this is something I just put on there because I think it's an interesting point because again, one of the huge procedures that we do when you bill for a total shoulder replacement, which is 23472, the vast majority of us are doing an open biceps tenodesis at the same time. 
Um, it is currently bundled in CCI, meaning in sort of the CMS, Medicare world, but there's still some private insurers that pay for it based on the documentation, meaning you do it separately. You actually document that you tina deece it to something either through soft tissue or through a, an anchor or something like that. So this is something, again, to be aware of. And I do think there's some geographic variability to this based on my discussions with my colleagues across the country. So a couple uh, last kind of shoulder specific coding issues that the Shoulder and Elbow Society have talked about and I think are critical for us to uh, talk on a little bit here. So when we're talking about slap and labor repairs, how do we code this? How do we bill for this? Uh, I think it's fairly straightforward. It, it, when you're working on the upper half of the labrum, you do a 29807, meaning the slap tear. When you're on the lower half of the labrum and doing a, some sort of capsular shift, you're doing a 29806, which is a capsular shift or capsular orophy. Um, Per the edits that have happened over the last few years, you can't use the 59 modifier to unbundle these two procedures if you do it at the same time. So if you do like a 360 repair uh, of a labrum, at least for the government side of things, you just have to do a modifier 22 and, 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 and state that you had increased procedural service and acknowledge that work. Does anyone on the panel have anything else on that but or that sort of the general feeling on that? I think that's that's true. And although you're not typically doing a 360 labor repair on a Medicare patient, right. most of the private payers tend to follow what Medicare does. So it is very hard to get um, to get reimbursed for more than just the 29806 or just the 29807. All right, we'll go to the next one. SDR, superior capsule reconstruction, has gained a lot of favor over the last uh, couple of years. There's not an actual code for this. And so it's very interesting. There's a lot of variability about how people build for this. Um, the best option is to code for whatever you did concomitantly, meaning if you did a rotator cuff repair, if you repaired the subs cap or you did a partial repair of the rotator cuff, then you bill for 29827. There are some that bill uh, for this as a sort of a capsular orphy or capsular shift. Um, I think my advice on this is to keep it to the 29827 and the 29823 and perhaps add a 22 modifier if your time to do the superior capsule reconstruction and the rotator cuff repair was felt to be twice that of what a normal rotator cuff repair is for you. So that is how I bill it. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone else bills it separate, uh, differently on the panel. All right. Subacromial decompression. Uh, this is sort of what uh, Dr. Levine and Dr. Bishop were just talking about. Um, so we can sort of move on. The, the, the basics of it is that it's not really accepted anymore. Um, loose body removal changes. This is actually one that I learned about by reading uh, on the Shoulder and Elbow, uh, American Shoulder and Elbow website. Um, so now with arthroscopic loose body removals, you basically have to show that your cannulas and your incisions have to be bigger to get that loose body out. So and back in the day, if you had a little pebble in the shoulder and you just scoop it out, You'd be able to bill for that now. It sort of has to show that you know you're putting a bringing a foreign body or a fairly large loose body out. I will tell you my personal experience is just um, you know four or five weeks ago I went in uh, for a patient who had a failed ladder J and pulled out basically their entire graft. And so in that case, that would be something that would qualify under the loose body removal changes because that was a big piece of bone that I had to take out. Um, and so that that would qualify for this. So that's just something to keep in mind. This is an arthroscopic picture from the other day and that little piece that's in there probably would not qualify for loose body removal. So uh, next slide. Spacers also important. Uh, they're moving us to the uh, using spacers of no longer the 119, 82, and 83, but now we're using spacers uh, much like the knee and hip uh, codes are. So 20704 or 20705. Um, but you can, uh, as far as I understand, do a 20705 and 23474 when you go back for replantation. So this is a new change, and I think it's uh, critical that everyone's aware of it because as shoulder and elbow surgeons, you'll be doing this a fair amount, and it's only going to increase over the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Next slide. So in summary, from my side on this, I apologize for going a little long, but uh, I believe that the more accurate your diagnosis uh, on this uh, for an ICD-10, the easier it is for your coders as well as your uh, hospital and your, um, and your business to understand what you're doing and then get reimbursed for what you're doing, which in turn is gonna help you with your RVUs or however else you are gonna get reimbursed. 
Uh, my recommendation is always build for what you do and also document what you do. And uh, my advice is also to not bill for what you don't do. And it seems simple, but really uh, it's a good rule. The more you do, make sure you document it and bill for it. But if you don't do it, don't, don't bill for it. Uh, and I also would say that make an effort to annually understand the changes that occur. They're complex, they're important. It's overwhelming when you're starting your practice starting off, but billing is a very critical thing and critical time to understand it. And the more you understand it from the get go, the more you can understand the changes. So, all right, that's me. And these are my citations. All right, then we'll go on to overview of ENM changes for 2021 with Dr. Sajadi. Thank you. Uh, great talks before me. I do want to thank Dale Blazer, who put together a lot of these slides as part of the coding committee, and Julie for her work, and Rob for providing me some of this information as well. I'm going to talk about the office side of things, the EM side. The goal of the changes that have come forth are to end the concept of note bloat, where documents, notes are full of useless information just for the goal of getting bullet points to code at an appropriate level of service. It's also designed to decrease the documentation burden. Next slide. Previous office notes, as well as the continuing forward notes in the hospital and emergency room, are that you have to document certain bullet points for the history and the physical exam, and then use an appropriate level of medical decision-making to combine that to choose your level of service. Alternatively, you could use time, and in the old model, time was based on face-to-face -face counseling of the patient, with 50% of the visit being based on that. Next. With the new changes, the key parts are that the uh, history and physical bullet requirements are eliminated. Instead, they've been replaced with what is called a medically appropriate history and or physical. This is determined by the treating provider. The level of service is then gonna be determined, when I say level of service, I'm referring to the billing level, is determined solely on two points. Number one, either medical decision-making or number two, time. And time is now the entire time you spend on that patient on the date of the encounter. They've also added new add-on codes if your time visit exceeds the highest level office visit by 15 minutes. And for each 15 minute increment, you can bill this code. They finally also eliminated the level one new patient visit. So the rationale for all this is that recording bullet points for history and physical is really counterproductive and that most physicians and providers would prefer to base their level of coding on the complexity of what they're dealing with, which is really the medical decision making. Time continues to be an option, but this is the model going forward. Next. When using time, I'm going to briefly talk about this, but uh, this now includes all the time you spend on the day of service. And it's important that this is noted as the day of service, the day you see the patient. You cannot include time if you spend some time the night before reviewing things before you go to the clinic, that does not count. But it does count all the time you spent on the day of service, reviewing their chart, looking through their test results, looking through their imaging, any history that you obtain from them or any appropriate exam, counseling you provide the patient, ordering of all tests and procedures, communicating with any other providers, and documentation. For one time, they're actually including the time you document as part of your reimbursement. Next slide. However, if you see on this chart, I don't think most orthopedic surgeons will probably use time as a determinant. If you look at the most commonly used code that we've historically used, a level three visit, a new patient requires a 30 to 44 minute of, uh, unit of time and a return is 20 to 29 minutes. By these criteria, we'd be seeing two to three patients an hour, which is uh, much less than the typical orthopedic surgeon sees. Next. So most of us will probably be using the medical decision-making. With the table, it has been had some revisions, and most importantly, there's been some clarifications. There's been previous vague terms that have been uh, solidified, and there are still continues to be four major levels of medical decision-making straightforward, low, moderate, and high. Next. This busy table uh, is important, and I know there's a lot of information now but uh, on this, but you can get a copy of this from the AMA website. And I highly recommend, I, I keep a laminated copy of this at my workstation right now since these changes went forward. 
And that way I can reference it to make sure, number one, most importantly, I'm documenting what I need to document for the level of service. And then number two, I'm billing the appropriate level of service. Um, I think I'll have that with me for quite a while. When it comes to medical decision-making, there are three major elements that are used to determine the level. Number one is the number and complexity of problems addressed at the encounter. Number two is the amount and or complexity of the data being analyzed. And number three is the risk of complications and or morbidity or mortality. The number and complexity of problems is just what are you seeing the patient for? What is their diagnosis or what is your, their uh, condition? And this can range from the minimal problem to a self-limited or one that will resolve to an acute complicated one, a chronic one, et cetera. Next slide. Based on the number and complexity, your visit level uh, of medical decision-making will vary. So for a straightforward level of medical decision-making, you're generally seeing a patient for a self-limited problem, one that's probably gonna resolve on its own. Um, a level two, or, or rather level three, would involve two of those problems or one stable chronic illness or an acute uncomplicated. And a level four takes us into the more chronic uh, issues with progression or stable, uh, multiple stable issues or an acute complicated issue. Next. For definitions, a self-limited or minor problem, again, is one that's going to run a definite and prescribed course, and the patient's going to be left with no real alteration to their overall health status. An acute complicated injury is one that requires treatment that involves evaluation of other body systems, not just the single one, and or may involve multiple treatment options for the patient. In our world, this would likely be something along the lines of an acute proximal humerus fracture. Next. A chronic condition is one that's defined as one with an expected duration of at least one year or until the death of the patient. It has nothing to do with severity. It's only duration. A stable condition is not what we typically think of with stable in the medical world. It really only refers to a treatment of a problem or a condition for which the treatment goals for that patient have been met. If the patient has not met those goals, then the condition is not deemed stable. Next. The main difference in the level four and five visits with regard to a chronic illness with progression uh, or exacerbation or side effects of treatment is the decision on whether or not hospitalization may come into play. A level four does not consider sending the patient to the hospital, where a level five that is under consideration that you may send them. It doesn't mean you are sending them. When it comes to the amount and or complexity of the data, there are three major categories. The first is the number of tests, documents, orders, uh, outside notes, or independent historians that you consult. Um, number two is the independent interpretation of tests, not separately reported. And number three is a discussion of management or test interpretation with outside physicians. Important to note here in the lower level, level three, is that you need two, uh, one of the two categories. In category one, you need to review two notes uh, or two tests or order two tests or an independent historian. This is some uh, situation where, particularly in the pediatric world where you have a patient too young to provide a history or perhaps an elderly patient with dementia who is unable to provide history and you have to obtain history from a caregiver. Next. When you're talking about the higher levels, you have to meet one of three categories for a level four. So a category one would involve three unique tests or notes, or an independent interpretation of tests or discussion with an outside provider. When it comes to independent interpretation of tests, this is very important that you document, not that you've reviewed the study. This needs to be documented that you've viewed and interpreted this study. And typically in our world, this is an MRI. Um, this is an important distinction between an employed or academic physician and a private practice physician on this one. The key point is that most of us will order x-rays in our office. And in an academic setting or an employed hospital model, those x-rays are likely to be separately billed for by the hospital. And the um, interpretation of those or the professional component of those will be billed by a radiologist usually. In a private practice, typically those are ordered and um, billed for by the physician 
and typically you bill for the technical and professional component. If you are billing the x-ray under the technical and professional component, you cannot separately use category two for inter independent interpretation of those x-rays as, as a bullet point for your medical decision-making because that would be viewed by the um, insurance companies and CMS as double dipping. Uh, and a level five involves getting two to three, two out of the three categories. Next. These next couple of slides show a few of the highlights for this. And again, just for a level three, you just need to get one of these two categories, two bullet points. So you review their outside notes and maybe you order an x-ray, you can count that. Next. The next level, level four, you have an independent interpretation of tests. If you have an MRI that you're reviewing and independently interpreting. Um, if you're assessing uh, an independent historian or multiple of the above, you can get to the level four. You can go on. Level five is gonna be an uncommon thing. Um, an important point out of these is level four and level five new patient visits for an upper extremity physician was nearly impossible under the old system because of the amount of bullet points required for physical exam requirements. Uh, certainly you could document exam on the lower extremities, but it wasn't really relevant to what you were doing. And, and now with these new requirements on medical decision-making, I think it's gonna be much easier for us to more routinely reach level four and in very rare cases still reach level five. Next. When it comes to risk of complications and or morbidity, this is really the likelihood of a complication or uh, a consequence to what you're treating the patient. So what is the uh, level of risk based on the normal consequences that would be expected with appropriate treatment? And this is where some of the other conditions come into play. If you have a surgery you're deciding on, do they have diabetes? Do they have other issues going on? Next. Level two, this has minimal risk. Really, you're not gonna be doing much for the patient uh, in terms of recommendations. Low risk, level three. This is typically sending a patient for physical therapy, recommending an over-the-counter medication, um, ordering additional tests such as an MRI or CAT scan. Next. Level four, you have a moderate risk. This involves a prescription drug, and this can include anti-inflammatories, even over-the-counter versions, but only if you actually write and send a prescription for, for example, a prescription level of ibuprofen. Um, if you have a decision for a minor surgery, minor surgeries are those with a 10-day, uh, a zero or 10-day global period as opposed to the 90-day global period. So for example, you're gonna uh, recommend the patient get an injection. This would fall under minor surgery and follow under level four, possibly a major surgery without risk factors, and then level five is the more complicated issues. Next. So the final important point when you're dealing with medical decision-making is we've seen the three columns of medical of the elements of medical decision-making. To determine your level of service, you must have two of the three columns meet that level of service. So for example, that are circled here, you have a patient with an acute uncomplicated illness, but minimal amount of data to review and your treatment is, for example, to send the patient for an MRI, and it has a low risk, you've met two of the three categories for a level three. Next. The work RVUs for our office notes have significantly, office visits have significantly increased. This is the good news out of the changes that have occurred this year. You can see that the range of improvements have been from anywhere from zero to 46% increase in our reimbursement. Um, and as Julie mentioned, this is uh, based on budget neutrality, which means they took this increased reimbursement from someplace else, which unfortunately does mean some surgical codes have gone down. Um, mostly the hip and knee surgeons have taken the brunt of that. Next. So in summary, for your new and established visits, for your documentation, you don't need to redocument the history, all the past elements and review of systems if your staff member has recorded it but you do need to document that you have reviewed it. For established visits, you only need to document what's changed and the exam needs to only be medically appropriate. Next. These changes only apply to outpatient visits. So if you're doing consultations, ER visits or inpatient visits, you still have to rely and know the old system. Um, this does seem to be an improvement for most office visits. I think it helps get to the core of what we're doing. Next. 
So you can, there are many uh, online resources to continue reading about this. The AACS website, the Academy website have lots of resources. If you use templates, be careful, make sure you review them to make sure that they're appropriate. Next. And most importantly, learn to routinely document all those items that are gonna be used to determine medical decision-making. If you're ordering tests, document that. If you're reviewing tests, document it. If you review outside records that have been sent with the patient, document it. Documentation is everything. For the history and physical, you still do have to document. And even if it isn't used for your billing, your level of service, your payers may review your office notes in determining their pre-authorization for a surgery or for advanced imaging. So what you say in that still does matter. And finally, for medical decision-making, make sure you look at two of the three elements to get your appropriate level of service. Two questions for the panels before we switch to Betsy. One, uh, I've, I have also seen some physicians recently use 99283 for an outpatient ED consult that is being discharged in a sling or a cast and never seen it prior to this. I was wondering if anyone else does this. 99283. Um, I, I will I have to honestly say, I'm not sure I'm familiar with that code. I've typically used the hospital codes when I'm evaluating patients in the ER um, for that. Uh, so I typically use the inpatient coding levels. Anybody else have an experience with this one? I don't either. I, I only use the inpatient coding levels. I will tell you that a lot of EMRs will block you from coding for certain things now. For example, uh, some inpatient consultations for patients who are there for observation won't be allowed on some EMRs and things like that. But I have not, I'm not familiar with using that code for ER discharges. Next question for the group. For a typical surgeon, what percentage of collections come from office hours versus surgery? Uh, from my practice, I can tell you that it's approximately 40% uh, from the office, 60% from surgery. I would actually say that when I was in my first three, four or five years in practice, I probably made more from my clinic than I did from my operating room. I would try to see as many patients as possible and do and injections. I would, I would do the injections. Um, my practice has transitioned over the last five or six years. So, you know, I'm probably 60% from the OR and 40% from clinics, but I still see a, you know, 40 to 50 patients in a, in a regular a clinic day. And so that does cover for a lot of my, Overage. I'd say I'm I'm a lot older than Rob and uh, Dr. Sajidi. <laughs> um, so at this point for me, I, it's probably 20% is office, probably 80% is surgery, which is very nice, I have to admit. That is nice. I'm jealous. <laughs> yeah, I was going to guess two thirds, one third, probably two thirds surgery. Um, but I don't know what the average number is for an orthopedist. <laughs> Well, good question. Well, we um, are going to have Dr. Nolan with a wealth of knowledge. I know it's getting late, but I think she has so much fabulous information to add that really ties in everything that we have gone through in a very practical sense. So without further ado, Dr. Nolan. Thank you. All right, so um, my disclosures are on the Academy website. The only ones that relate to this talk are the Education Committee putting together this uh, talk. And um, the Board of Counselors and the Congressional Ambassador roles are both our grassroots efforts at advocacy. And um, so I feel like that's worth mentioning for any of you that might have that sinking feeling in your stomach when you're hearing some of this stuff or hearing about the changes that are happening to some of this stuff and some of the denials uh, information in this talk. If you are motivated to do something about that um, and you want to help with our advocacy efforts for ourselves and our patients, um, then that is a great avenue. And thank you to Julie and the committee for providing slides. We're going to cover uh, billing for first assistant, a bit about revenue cycle management, um, and some of the major denial categories and um, reasons for denials. If you're billing for a first assistant, um, the billing is based on their credentials. Um, so a physician first assistant gets paid a little bit better than a, for instance, a PA first assistant. So you're going to use your code for the um, AS assistant surgery, and then um, 
the additional modifier based on what their credentials are. So, um, and the commercial payers vary the um, Medicare uh, pays you, I think 16% uh, for a physician first assistant, 16% of what the primary surgeon's fee is. And then the um, PA, you get 85% of that 16%. Um, there are some other credentials that serve as first assistance. Um, uh, I know with RNFAs, it's generally not reimbursed in Oklahoma, but it sometimes is in other states. And TSAs and CFAs are basically hospital-based, um, so the hospital can bill for them, but you cannot usually. Um, the major difference in the documentation, um, whether you're at a community hospital or an academic hospital that has an ortho training program, um, is whether or not you need to um, it, you use the uh, different code, but whether or not you need to document that there was not a qualified resident available. Um, in any of those cases, you need to document who your assistant was, why you needed an assistant, um, and what their role was. So uh, most of us use a template for that. So um, something like they were instrumental in patient positioning, retraction, irrigation, suction, wound closure, something like that. Um, and uh, only certain codes are eligible to be paid for a first assistant. So um, if you do like uh, time of salvo release, you may not be able to, even if you have a first assistant, you may not, may not be able to get paid for them. But if you do a total shoulder, you should be able to. Uh, we're going to go through some of the basics of the revenue cycle management, payer contract negotiation um, and management, which um, I actually do not have a ton of experience with. Uh, claims processing, denials management, appeals. Next. Um, so obviously you'd like to have the most favorable rate possible. Um, I think if you have a maybe the lion's share of that market for that payer in that area, you might have a little bit of ability to go to say Blue Cross, Blue Shield and say, you know, we'd like to negotiate our rates. But um, in my world, I do not. <laughs> um, next. Uh, you do want to ensure that they're paying at the contracted rates, and this happens all the time, actually, that, um, you know, whatever the, the fee is they're supposed to pay, say, for a total shoulder, they may send you um, less than that. Your EMR, your EMR may write it off as um, contractual obligation and then just close it. So you need to actually comb through your EOBs and see if the rate that you're um, being paid is the rate that you're supposed to be. Um, it's estimated up to 25% of a practice's contractual allowances might be inaccurate, um, which means you're leaving money on the table if you're not checking them and submitting corrections. <laughs> um, your front end folks can uh, make or break you too. Um, you want to make sure that, that the codes are complete and accurate. Um, and we could probably go quickly through this part. Um, you want to understand the nature and the cause of the denials and put in place processes to prevent that from being happening from happening. So if you realize that a certain type of denial is happening as a pattern in your practice, figure out how to change your office um, protocols so that you can avoid that. Um, up to 35% of unpaid claims might be inappropriately denied. Um, I tell my office stuff all the time, it's a war of attrition. I think they're just hoping that you'll give up. <laughs> Next. Um, coverage denials represent a significant source of lost revenue. So um, $54 billion of outpatient physician fees are challenged uh, by payers every year. If 35% of those are wrong, um, then that's $19 billion of our money that they're keeping. <laughs> um, so you absolutely should uh, resubmit these. Um, likelihood of uh, a challenge claim depends on the insurance and not surprisingly, um, Medicaid is um, the highest. <laughs> you wanna look at your processes, the front end, the coding and um, billing, as well as the processing of your claims. Uh, one of the uh, common reasons for front-end denials is coverage not in effect. Um, we have a two-stage process for verifying people's coverage. So when they're making their appointment um, as a new patient, we verify the coverage, but um, they also need to verify it on the day of um, because it might have expired yesterday. Um, not having a referral if they're in a managed care plan and a referral is required. 
um, not authorized, um, the, our authorization is needed. So there are certain uh, procedures that are just not covered, certain codes um, subscribe or not found, wrong insurance. Um, so your front desk folks um, have to get all of that um, information incorrectly in the first place. Next. Uh, more common denial categories, and y'all, this list goes on and on and on. <laughs> um, the global period bundling, bundling, we did talk about the bundling with the surgical codes and the um, um, global period, uh, most of our surgeries are 90 days, so, you know, you can't, for instance, bill for an e &M code during uh, their global period, unless it's for, say, a different problem, you're, you have a there's a modifier for that as well. Um, but you have a reason that it's not part of their global care for that surgery because that um, care is generally included in the surgical fee. Incorrect date or site of service. Um, and then I added on here in patient only list. So there are um, some procedures um, that have to be done at certain types of facilities. Um, and sometimes that is also a barrier issue. Um, medical necessity. Um, uh, we'll talk about it again in the um, prior auths, but not having that documented can cause a denial. Um, invalid modifiers, invalid diagnosis codes, um, payment review, uh, invalid CPT codes, um, provider number, questions regarding um, the billing MD, and sometimes that comes down to like your credentialing with that payer. Next. Um, Claim information is not complete. I mean, these should all be scrubbed before you send them out. So hopefully you can identify um, that before it happens. Um, need additional information. Um, sometimes they need additional reports. Uh, secondary insurance. Um, you need the EOB for the first insurance. Uh, this has happened to me, a pending accident report. So the, the insurance companies will we'll try anything they can to get somebody else to pay the bill. And so we have, you know, if somebody tells you that they've been in an accident, then you know that that's a, a potential uh, third party and maybe paying the bill. But um, uh, we actually had a patient who said no, but her insurance company, for whatever reason, thinks that she has been in an accident, wants her to fill out a form, which she won't do. <laughs> and the uh, insurance company basically is trying to subrogate the claim. So what that means is that then they want to pass it off to uh, the car insurance carrier. Um, provider not certified, uh, not authorized, past the time. Timely filing that, you know, if you put the right processes in your plate in place should hopefully not happen. Um, Inaccurate information um, that's on the front end if you're not getting their correct insurance information, late claims again, uh, uncovered procedure, lack of prior auth, lack of a referral. <laughs> um, I'm not going to read them all to you, um, but there, there are so, so many reasons that they deny the claims. Um, but you want to try to identify the patterns, um, and these are four of the big ones um, that you can um, put processes in place to address. Um, I think we, we basically covered this on the front end when they're um, uh, doing the intake of a new patient, making sure that all of their demographic and insurance information is correct. Um, most of the uh, carriers allow you 45 to 90 days to submit your claim. So if you did not get it submitted in that time, it's likely that you will not get paid. Um, the office visits you usually get submitted pretty quickly because they're generally not waiting for other information, but sometimes um, operative reports and things um, hold up surgical codes. So you really want to prioritize. Those may be your um, uh, larger fees. So you really want to prioritize your um, larger claims and make sure that those get submitted in a timely fashion. Next. Um, I'm just going to skip past it. There are some uh, carve outs and in insurance plans, things that they just don't cover. Thanks. Um, this was actually something I learned in putting together this talk. So um, there, this is an official government advice to us is that if there is a reason to believe that the patient is going to have a bill, it's the obligation is actually on us to tell them <laughs> that they may, it may not be covered and they may have a bill um, prior to performing the service. 
Um, prior authorization is something that's becoming more and more common that the carriers are requiring that. Um, and it's something that our office staff spend a ton of time on. And sometimes we have to spend time on getting on a, a phone call or um, providing additional documentation. Um, the financial burden to the practices is immense. Um, if you get the prior authorization, it doesn't guarantee you'll get paid. But if you don't, <laughs> it almost, and, and if one was required, it almost guarantees that you'll have problems with your claim. Um, also, you still have to code it properly. Um, so having a prior authorization um, for an incorrect code isn't going to help you. Um, if you have, and this happens, um, if you find something that you need to address at surgery and it wasn't part of the prior authorization, then you need to make sure that your, your dictation clearly addresses that. Um, and you may have to retroactively authorize it. In general, you wanna authorize all of the codes that you think that you will be doing. Um, the referral thing is uh, common with uh, managed plans, TRICARE, um, stuff like that. Um, and patients can get frustrated being uh, in the middle of that. Um, but, uh, you know, most of the time we end up calling the referring office, which is generally their primary care doc. Um, but if they need one and you don't obtain one and then you see the patient, you may not get paid for that visit. Um, incorrect or uh, incomplete coding, um, at any part of the coding can cause claims denials. Next. Um, you also, we talked about the bundling and so you, you can't separate out things that are included in uh, the primary code. Next. Also want to make sure that the coding book you're using is up to date <laughs> because they, they do change typically in January. Um, you want to make sure all of your documentation is sent um, with the claim in the first place, particularly like operative reports, um, your clinic notes, that stuff. Uh, duplicate claims are a common cause of denials. Um, so if you submit an edit, um, say that you um, you saw a patient for an office visit, but you forgot that you did an x-ray and you, you own the x-ray, so you're going to um, bill for the x-ray, um, but the um, professional and the technical service, but you just forgot to attach that to the claim in the first place. Um, and then you want to go back and submit it. When you sit, submit the correction, you should include the original claim number so they know it belongs to that claim so that they don't consider it a duplicate code and, or duplicate submission and just deny it. Um, medical necessity is defined as healthcare services or supplies needed to prevent, diagnose, or treat an illness, injury, condition, disease, and its symptoms that meets accepted standards of medicine. This is not the same thing as the medical decision making um, that Dr. Sajadi just talked about that affects your e &M coding. Um, this is whether or not your documentation supports your treatment plan, essentially. Next. Um, this is a common reason for denials as well, and it's a source of frustration um, for us. Um, a lot of times you're having to um, track down PT notes, for instance, to show that they tried six weeks of PT and they failed that. <laughs> um, you know, having to gather all this documentation to essentially make your case of why the patient needs this treatment. Um, and sometimes you have to get on a peer to peer phone call with somebody who may or may not be an orthopedic surgeon and, um, you know, make your case for why this patient needs this treatment. Um, it's helpful to do templates, checklists, um, all of that kind of stuff to make sure that the stuff is in your documentation in the first place to prevent having to do those down the road steps. Next. In particular, you want to document the diagnosis, the body part, the laterality, <laughs> the patient's symptoms. Functional limitations is a, is a big one, so don't just say they have pain. Say they can't put away the milk in the fridge. They can't do their job doing X um, functional limitations that are relevant. Um, relevant imaging and what kind of conservative treatment they've tried and their response to it and how long they tried it because sometimes the guidelines require a certain amount of time. Next. Um, 
back to our, our advice that we are to tell the patients that um, if there is a reason to think that this service we're um, discussing with them or recommending might not be covered, then um, we need to tell the patients that. Next. So in order to appeal, you've gotten a denial. In order to appeal, you wanna understand what their reason for um, denial was. Um, usually there's a code put on the EOV and then the, um, a key to the codes at the bottom that you can read and um, try to figure out why they've denied it um, so that you can address that. You also should uh, keep a calendar of when the appeals deadlines are so that you don't miss them. Next. Um, there may or may not be a lot of explanation. Typically you'll get, like I said, a code that, um, you know, might have a word or two attached to it. <laughs> but if you can figure out why it was denied, and sometimes you have to call and talk to somebody or your, your biller may have to call and talk to somebody, um, that can be actually really helpful sometimes. Document who you talked with, the day, the time, what they told you, um, and a reference number for the phone call. write a detailed appeal letter explaining to them as much as you can using layman's terms um, why you think that the code is correct um, and why you're appealing the decision, why you think the denial is incorrect. Um, and as we said, 35% of the denials might be incorrect on their part. Um, this is a, a hall of shame uh, <laughs> thing here that, you know, they may or may not have read your uh, medical records before denying it. Next. Um, you want to include supporting documentation as well. And we actually um, uh, will use the NCCI edit sometimes with that, and we'll use the uh, codex. So the AOS puts out a product that you might call the codex, and it has both the web and the um, a web page and an app on your phone. And I like, I like the app because it's there with me at the hospital, um, wherever I am. Um, and it says what is included, for instance, if it's a denial that something is global that is included in the primary procedure code, it has the global service data on there and you can, and there's a list literally of this code is included, this code is not included. Um, and oftentimes it addresses the, the question that you may be um, trying to appeal next. But don't be mad, <laughs> don't be rude, and don't be arrogant. Write, write a polite but succinct letter um, explaining uh, what you did and why the codes are supported. Um, and then try to avoid using our sort of medical lingo, try to use layman's terms as much as you can. Next. The appeal statistics are daunting. <laughs> so 40 to 60% of initial Medicare denials are successfully appealed. Um, so it is worth working them. Um, but the difference in time, 18 days to get paid if it's not denied in the first place versus 126 days on average if you have to appeal it is enormous. Um, I mentioned the codex already, and I highly recommend it. I really like it. Um, there's some references for you on the next page, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you, everybody. We're uh, about 15 minutes over, and so we need to end the session. We thank you all tremendously for your time, efforts, um, and we look forward to the folks joining us next week's session. Thank you once again for all your hard work. Thanks, everyone. Great session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.